title misses out what I suggested, not, no criticism of the Institute, which I'm very grateful to in, for to inviting me here, but missed out what I proposed as a, um, as a subtitle, uh, which is what I'm really going to speak to. Reflections on the EU as a foreign policy actor, um, strengths and weaknesses, past and future. So I'm going to say something first about past, then about strengths, then weaknesses, and then the future. I'm not going to say very much about, um, <clears throat> about contemporary issues um, because it's now already a year since I left and uh, there are lots of things going on that I really don't know what's, what's happening. Um, in many of these issues, you, to understand what, what's happening, you really have to follow them day to day um, and I haven't attempted to, uh, to do that except I know a little bit about Serbia, Kosovo. It says special advisor to Catherine Ashton. That's true. That's confined to, that's confined to Burma. That's the only things I really know very much about. Um, uh, I was myself involved in the EU as a foreign policy actor um, from about uh, 30 years ago. I became the European correspondent more or less at the same time as Margaret Thatcher became Prime Minister in, in Britain. Um, and I lived through uh, in that role and then in subsequent roles in which I still took an interest in, uh, in what was going on in Europe, particularly when I was at the head of the planning staff, um, uh, and then when I was in the Cabinet Office, and then when I was in Brussels. For me, the big things that I remember are um, uh, the Venice Declaration, uh, now 30-something years old, uh, not yet implemented. Um, the, um, uh, the crisis in the 1990s uh, in the Balkans, um, uh, extremely, um, uh, well, actually a big European failure, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, uh, the second crisis, another big European failure on Iraq, um, uh, and then I was myself involved uh, in different ways at different times in the negotiations with Iran, as, as Mari mentioned. Um, uh, but. Um, uh, it forms for me a substantial part of my past. There's one, those for me are some of the kind of the big moments. There's one which I missed because I, I came too late to the European Union um, uh, that's worth mentioning, um, and that's the Helsinki uh, process. I don't know if anybody is as old as me and, and remembers it, but... Um, uh, this was actually a remarkable moment in the history of European policy uh, because um, uh, if you read the, the story at the time, you'll find that um, the whole process was being uh, uh, rubbished by Henry Kissinger who thought that um, detente should not be um, organized by large numbers of people talking to each other but by personal conversations between him and someone in Moscow. Um, and um, uh, actually, uh, quite a lot of the time, was trying to close the operation down. And there was a remarkable degree of, uh, of European unity in it. And what happened in, at Helsinki, in particular, the, um, a lot of the things that went into, into basket three, human contacts and that, were actually only there because of a united European position which was really a remarkable beginning for European foreign policy. Um, and I'm not sure that um, much we've done after it has really been as, uh, as successful as that. Though there have been, and I'll come to one, I, one or two of what I think have been some important successes. The, um, uh, that was a little bit about the past. On the strengths, um, I think that, first of all, one ought to understand that the EU itself uh, is, represents a kind of statement, um, uh, and that has its own impact, that uh, now 28, but at previous times, 
when, when uh, my country and yours joined nine and then later on 10, 15, 16 countries who for about a thousand years one way or another have fought each other to work together in such close collaboration is something that is, is an unmistakable and important phenomenon on the world scene. Um, the, uh, and I mentioned the failure in the Balkans in the 1990s, but this was, although it was a failure, although there were, there were many things that we got wrong, actually even through this, people continued to um, look, talk to each other, try and look for ways forward, uh, intense and acrimonious debates went on, but they went on. Um, uh, very different from um, what happened about 80 years before, uh, uh, first in 1913 and then in 1914, the Second Balkan War and then the events that led up to, uh, to World War I. Uh, if you want to know why World War I happened, well, it's very complicated. But there was, actually, there was a general system failure. And that system has changed completely. That even when the European Union was not uh, doing well in the Balkans, even when there were lots of divisions and disagreements, nevertheless, there was a much closer understanding between everybody else than there, than there ever has been before. Um, and that still seems to me to be, uh, to be an extremely important fact. Later on, and, I, and I'll come to that, we actually have done, I think, we have done quite well in the Balkans subsequently, but I'll come to that in a second. Um, uh, so uh, the existence of the EU itself matters. Um, second, um, uh, the most powerful, uh, if, if that for me is a kind of political miracle, the second political miracle that's come out of the European Union has come with uh, the, uh, the great enlargement to the East in following, following 1989. Um, what happens normally after a revolution? Well, the answer is you get a civil war. Um, uh, you can see a whole series of countries in which this has taken place. If not an actual civil war, you have, uh, you do not normally get a, um, uh, immediate establishment of a democratic regime. Um, uh, <coughs> normally what you get is some combination of uh, Robespierre, Napoleon, Lenin and Stalin. Uh, um, uh, or as I say, um, uh, some kind of civil conflict. And you see that now in, the, uh, in the, the Arab Spring countries, in many of them at any rate. Um, uh, so that this did not happen in uh, in Central Europe after 1989 is historically highly unusual. And the European framework, which includes NATO as well as the European Union, the European framework was central to that. And I think in some ways uh, it may have misled some of the more enthusiastic neocons in Washington who began to think that all that you needed to do was knock a dictator over and then uh, democracy would flourish. Um, I think that it happened in Europe uh, is a result not just of this thing, but of, of very many things. There's a lot of history as well. Um, and actually, this was one of the important results of, of Helsinki, um, was that there, were, um, there was a recognized uh, leadership of people opposed to the regimes. Um, that perhaps is the most important result of, of Helsinki. Um, uh, but I think that the European framework or Euro-Atlantic framework uh, played an enormously important part in, that, in it as well. We also see this, um, and now I, I come to the kind of recovery story in the Balkans. Um, uh, after the failures of the, um, uh, in the Balkans in the 1990s, or rather towards the end of the 1990s, uh, the European Union concluded that the only way to deal with the problem uh, was to be ready to accept these countries as members when they met the required standards. And that has made an enormous difference uh, in the region, um, which is now, uh, uh, is now not, it's not, the work is not finished by a long way, um, but 
in most countries uh, is now doing much better than it was before. Um, the, uh, uh, there's one, all of the successes are partial, but there was one important success around about the year 2000, which is not much noticed by anybody. It actually coincided with the arrival of my boss, Javier Solana, um, uh, in Macedonia, uh, where um, uh, an extraordinarily small NATO force was deployed, actually without the Americans, because they didn't want to have anything to do with it. Um, but uh, we and others were afraid that there was going to be a war there, too. Um, a small NATO force was deployed rather to reassure than to do anything else. Um, and then there was a negotiation conducted by Javier Solana with support from uh, the NATO Secretary General, George Robertson, which um, ended up in the ORID agreement amending the constitution in Macedonia. So far, touching wood, that has maintained the peace uh, in that country. Um, more recently, you will have seen that uh, the negotiations which I was involved in in the preliminary phase um, has been brought to, I wouldn't say a conclusion, because those involved in diplomacy will know that there's never quite such a thing as a conclusion, um, but has been brought to past an important stage by Catherine Ashton. Um, uh, and um, uh, there's an agreement between uh, Serbia and Kosovo reached after a remarkable process in which she had dinners with the Prime Minister of Serbia and the Prime Minister of Kosovo about 10 times, I think, um, and allowed them to talk about their, how they saw the world and eventually out of this produced an agreement which uh, uh, I hope very much will safeguard the future of the Serb community in north of Kosovo. Um, and will enable the two countries to live together in the future. Um, th this is still not over. Nothing is, as I said, over. Actually, there are elections coming up um, in, a, uh, uh, in the beginning of November is the first round of elections. And last this week already, there were more negotiations about the conditions under which Serb politicians might go and encourage um, the voters there to participate in the election. So each of these, each of these things, which sometimes gets a line in a newspaper, has normally got behind it all kinds of issues which you never hear of, and uh, uh, and many more hours of discussion of things that you wouldn't believe. Um, uh, so there's always much, much more work than you see in what seems to be sometimes a simple and obvious result. <coughs> Um, but for me, that also is a um, uh, is uh, really uh, a, a remarkable success. That's connected to enlargement. Um, there's no doubt about it. Um, uh, Serbia has has made up its mind that it wants to be a member of the European Union. Um, uh, this is an extremely big prize for um, countries in the Balkans, which are poor. Um, uh, which desperately need investment. Uh, it's an extremely big uh, carrot for both Serbia and, and, and Kosovo. But it's also, and this comes to the <coughs> third thing that I think of as a strength, um, uh, it's also a demonstration of what can be done when the European Union as a whole operates together um, and with the different institutions as well. Um, uh, there's no doubt in this case that collaboration with, uh, uh, with Germany was very important, um, but also, as far as I was concerned, collaboration with the Commission was very important. Uh, and in some, one particularly difficult issue is connected to the management of the border, um, and the Commission provided extremely important support in um, resolving the problems now, what's it called? Integrated border management, I think is what it's called. Um, I should say, by the way, that this in the Serbia-Kosovo documents is referred to as IBM, because if you're Kosovo, you describe it as integrated border management. If you're Serbian, you describe it as integrated boundary management, because you don't recognize this as being an international border. 
um, and these kind of problems crop up everywhere. But if people want to solve them, they can all be solved. Um, uh, and this was, for me, this was not just an effort of uh, the European institutions. It was also a collective effort of the, uh, of the European institutions and the member states. All the more remarkable um, because five of the member states don't recognize <coughs> Kosovo. Uh, fundamentally divided European Union on this subject, and yet it has produced, uh, I think, a very positive result. Personally, I thought that I, didn't, I never minded the fact that there were non-recognizers, provided they interpreted non-recognition in a flexible way. In some ways, it was almost useful, because when you had people who were on the Serbian side of the issue combining with people who were on the Kosovo side of the issue collectively saying to the two sides, you've got to agree, uh, that was a message which was very difficult to, to resist. Um, so uh, I think the third strength is that I think that um, when you can get that miraculous thing and everybody works together, uh, the EU is potentially enormously powerful. And I mentioned a couple of small other examples of that, which are, which are recent. One is, is a slightly complicated one, and I won't go into too much detail, but um, I wouldn't say that the EU has succeeded in Somalia. I think anybody is a lot, we're, we and everybody else is a long way from anything you can call a success. Um, we have succeeded with others um, in very sharply reducing the amount of piracy off the Somali coast. We've succeeded in reducing the number of, um, uh, the number of pirates. Um, uh, the EU operation, when I was way back in my past, um, when I was working in the Foreign Office, people sometimes said to me, what's your ambition for the European Union? And I used to say, um, perhaps not completely seriously, well, I think we ought to have a fleet in the Pacific. Um, well, we haven't made it to have a fleet in the Pacific, but we have a flotilla in the Indian Ocean. Um, and um, uh, what's even more remarkable um, for an organization which is you know, basically a rather peaceful organization and is not very warlike, is that this, um, uh, the task force, in the, in the Indian Ocean actually has got tougher rules of engagement than the NATO task force is one of those as well. Um, uh, and it has executed one attack on the shore. It didn't kill anybody, but it destroyed a lot of quite expensive equipment and discouraged people very strongly in the idea that actually piracy was a profitable business. Um, but more than that, the other things that the European Union has been able to do is it it doesn't just, doesn't just have, have ships. It has um, an effort to support the transitional federal government, um, uh, including training some of its military. Um, it has a very substantial aid effort indeed. Um, and even it has arrangements with some of the literal states uh, for um, uh, trial and, if necessary, imprisonment of captured pirates. And all of those things you can do partly because of the fact that the EU has got relations with all these countries and, and aid budgets. Um, uh, 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 also because um, some of the member states have got very useful relationships as well, which they can use in trying to set up these arrangements. Um, so all of those things, the EU's capacity to operate in a number of different fields, it's not just it's, de it's definitely not a military organization. It's a political organization which occasionally has the possibility of, of, uh, of military activity. Um, and for me, that's the right way to do things, to have a political lead. And we now happily have a special representative in Somalia who's creating a political program there. So I regard that as being another example of what I said. Uh, together, the EU can actually be a powerful body. The second example that I mentioned briefly, because uh, is, is, the, um, is the, the Middle East. Um, 
not an area in which we've had really much success. The Venice Declaration was important. It um, uh, set a new course that was eventually been adopted by more or less the whole international community, the two-state solution, the whole international community except Israel. Um, the, uh, but, um, uh, and really rather little has happened in this area, except of course that the building of settlements has continued. Um, but I was very struck last year when the EU had what seemed to be a failure in that we looked extremely disunited at the United Nations on, uh, someone else will remember the technicalities of it, on it was a kind of higher grade of recognition of the Palestinian Authority at the, at the UN. There was a three-way split in the, in the EU, looked very unattractive, but if you look at the EU conclusions in December after that, which even so provoked a rather angry reaction from Tel Aviv. If you look at the conclusions in December after that, you find unanimity uh, from the European Union on the question that uh, um, if there is further uh, building of settlements in, um, now I better not quote the zone because I may get it wrong, I think it's Area C, but that don't... Uh, um, consider that to have a question mark after it in the record, um, uh, that the EU would be ready to take very serious action. Um, uh, well, I won't go into the story of how that happened, but you find that the, um, but for those who know the Middle East, this was a, uh, this was an important step. Um, uh, what got the headlines was the division in New York. Um, but actually what was much more significant was the agreement in December. Um, uh, there is, of course, with 28 member states, there is, of course, a wide variety of, of views. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I was talking a little bit earlier to three or four of you um, about the EU's policies on Burma over the, uh, over the long period. Um, I, I don't think that our policies were, were bad. Actually, what the policies represented was they represented um, a compromise between those who wanted very fierce sanctions indeed and those who thought the right policy was engagement. And what we did in the end, uh, this was following a number of things, but in particular following the uh, uh, killing of peaceful demonstrating monks in the streets of Yangon in, um, in 2008. Um, uh, what we did in the end was we had sanctions which were not, not trade sanctions, nothing like the sanctions which the United States uh, employed, which were extraordinarily tough. Somebody I know, um, uh, their son on a visit there um, from the USA, made the mistake of using a credit card to buy a book from Amazon while they were located in Myanmar. And then when they got to Thailand, they found every card they owned had been cancelled. That was US sanctions. Um, EU sanctions were much softer than that and were really more symbolic than real. At the same time, in recognition of the fact that this was an extremely poor country suffering from a number of grave humanitarian crises, we also had aid programs at the same time operated through NGOs rather than, than through the government. So you could say, you could either describe this policy as being a complete mess, or you could describe it as being, uh, and that's how I would do it, as being a constructive compromise between two approaches, each of which uh, had something to offer. The other way um, in which I, I find myself actually working in the European Union I find the variety of people and opinion is um, a kind of extraordinary opportunity. Um, for example, working on the Balkans um, at different stages, the team included, um, I remember in particular, well, still very close friends with uh, a colleague from Italy, uh, a colleague from Greece, uh, and a lady from Slovenia. A uh, lady from Slovenia, of course, spoke the language very well. Um, the, the colleagues from Greece and Italy um, 
these are people who live in a society which is much less ordered than uh, Britain is. Um, uh, and as a result, it seems to me always they have a much acute, more acutest understanding of power um, uh, in a place like the Balkans than some uh, than I and uh, Northern Europeans sometimes do. So I think the variety of the European Union uh, is also a strength. Um, I wanted finally to say on the side of strengths, I'm leaving too little time for the weaknesses, so I have to run through those very quickly. On the, finally, I wanted to say on the side of strengths, um, I, I, think, um, I think even from the days when Murray was involved in it and I was involved in it, I think that the, the political and security committee has grown in strength. Um, uh, when I, um, I talked to some of uh, the colleagues in the political and security committee recently about some of the difficult issues that they dealt with, issues on which you wouldn't expect there to be a consensus, like Kosovo, like the Middle East, like indeed military action in Somalia. Um, uh, a lot of them said, well, actually their instructions were increasingly not the kind of things which arrived from Dublin, they were a process of negotiation. And the way in which opinion was going in the political and security committee was increasingly important. The political and security committee is, I think, a much more important actor now than it was a few years ago. And that potentially is a strength. Weaknesses, I'll go through those rather quickly. Um, the weaknesses, a lot of the time, have had to do with machinery. Um, the OSCE, uh, the CSE it was then, the Helsinki process, was a process remarkably well suited to the European Union at that time because it had no machinery. It was just a bunch of people trying to agree with each other and they managed to on this case and it was a conference and it was all about words and they were extremely useful and had a very important effect. Words were fine and the Venice Declaration also was words but turning that into action following it up systematically, there was very little machinery for that. The presidency, which was and is a wonderful institution, and I have very fond memories of being in Dublin and in other parts of Ireland in, during Irish presidencies, the presidency had a lot of advantages, but it's not a very good piece of machinery if you want to pursue a policy relentlessly over the years, which is what you need to do in a lot of uh, foreign affairs. So the, um, and in particular, the real, one of the real crises in the Balkans was even if the EU had had a policy in the 1990s, which it didn't, there wouldn't have been machinery to implement it. Well, uh, the machinery that we have now is far from perfect, uh, but it's a lot better than, uh, than it was. The second thing that has to be said, of course, is I've said when the EU comes together, um, uh, it has real strengths, but there are lots of occasions uh, when I'm afraid it doesn't come together. Um, uh, the, um, for me, Iraq was a really big failure. Um, uh, and perhaps that's an example of a general class of failures, which is that the EU is not very good at dealing with great powers, superpowers. Uh, it's not very good with China. Uh, it's better with Russia now than it, than it was. Uh, the Commission has played a very good role in that. Um, it's not very good always with the USA. Particularly, it's very good at agreeing with the USA, but when the real need to disagree with the USA, as there was on Iraq, uh, I think an opportunity was missed. Um, uh, the, um, uh, it seems to me sometimes that the kind of gravitational pull of the large superpower tends to pull the EU apart. Not always, but sometimes. Uh, and I wish we could go back sometimes to, the, um, to 1973, uh, when the EU stood up to Dr. Kissinger with very positive effects. Um, uh, and I think I'll just say two things. The EAS uh, is an organization with enormous potential, with enormously good people in it, um, uh, with uh, I think a potential for a real uh, collective effort, particularly abroad in posts, but 
there are some serious things that need thinking about. That's not a surprise after a couple of years. Um, there was a paper by about 11 countries, I think. I don't know if others have seen it, which, which had, I thought, some very sensible suggestions in it. But there's more to be done. Uh, there's more to be done there, particularly problem of personnel management is obviously very complicated and difficult. Um, uh, uh, that and other things uh, need some attention. Um, I think the EAS needs to become a kind of organic reflection of the political and security committee. Um, and I think that the commission needs to see it as an opportunity rather than a threat. So anyway, I've done past strengths and weaknesses. I don't think I'll say very much about the future because uh, whatever anybody says about the future is normally wrong. So let's leave that for the Q&A because I run out of time anyway. Thank you. Thank you.